Okay, I think it's uh, time to start the BOF. Um, we have uh, Bruce and his cohorts are going to talk about cost management on commercial cloud platforms. Uh, welcome to this BOF on cost management on commercial clouds. Um, this BOF actually had its origins in a workshop on um, data archives and their challenges that was held in uh, Sydney, Australia in August of 2019. And one of the issues that came up that many people were bothered about was how you manage costs on commercial clouds. And um, it was thought that bringing this to a wider audience and having a discussion at ADAS would be a good thing to do. So this is why we're here. Um, the organization of the, of the BOF is gonna be as follows. Um, there's gonna be um, a series of five short talks by Will, Eric, Eva, uh, and myself followed by a uh, 30, 35 minute discussion session. Um, here are some of the discussion topics that I suggested, but certainly by no means limited to those. So if everyone, someone has a favorite, please uh, go ahead and let me know. Uh, there is a, a poll open that I posted on uh, the Discord page, the Discord channel for this BOF. Uh, a number of people have already voted, so please continue if you wish to do so. And the idea was to guide the discussion section. Uh, so the session will be recorded, as you know. Uh, I'm gonna ask, please not ask questions during talk so that we can retain as much time as we can for discussion at the end. Uh, your microphones, of course, will be muted. Muted. Uh, please raise your hand to speak. And if you had a comment or a question in discussion, I'd ask please if you can use the Q and A rather than the Discord channel, uh, so I don't you know, only have to keep my eyes on one place. Uh, thank you. That's much appreciated. There is the Discord channel, and I suggest that we use that for continuing discussion after the end of the boff. All right. So. Without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass the baton to Will O'Malley and he is going to talk about hosting the Ruben Observatory Interim Data Facility on a cloud platform. Take it away, Will. Hi. Um, so yeah, let's get straight into it. Only 10 minutes, that's not very long for doing this. I'm very happy if people put on some video and I can see somebody, so I'm not like doing some studio thing, but maybe there's none of that around. Um, so I've gone too far. Uh, yeah, so I think the first thing, there was a bunch of questions. How do you, you know, um, cope with costs and how do you rein things in? Um, we did a few experiments with Google and Amazon. They're very happy to do these type of things. They're usually very cost effective in that they charge you very little or nothing to do them. If you say, I want to do a proof of concept. Uh, I've listed the three that we did here. Um, the first one was uh, deploying our already cloud ready things. So that was kind of relatively easy. We knew that was going to work pretty well, uh, but we hadn't scaled up like our science platform before. So we were able to do some scaling. That was nice. Um, and some data transfer to show that we could do data transfers quickly. Uh, then we went on with Google and said, okay, what do we want to do processing like with Condor and run a big batch job? And we, we reproduced our batch processing also. So a couple of links in here. I guess you get these slides afterwards, and they're clickable links. Uh, you can also just do dmtn125.lsst.io, and you can get them. Um, then on the Amazon side, we thought we should do something similar. Um, and we also ran with uh, uh, HT Condor and Annex um, and ran our processing on there. Um, and so there's a couple of notes describing how that went. Um, and then we did some uh, HSC reprocessing with that. Uh, Dino has a paper just, just literally finished, I think, and out. Uh, there's a link there to it at osf.io2 or QFB. Um, that's uh, giving his view of uh, tuning up that stuff and, and what it means to run it on Amazon. So I think that's a really good starting point. Um, from Ruben's perspective, I just wanted to point out that we have this US data facility um, idea, which is doing uh, processing in the States. So the data all comes from Chile to the States. We also have INTP3 um, doing 50% of the processing. And most recently, uh, UK are talking about taking on 25%. So we're going to end up with a quite distributed processing. Um, and cloud was, uh, was one of the interesting things. At the time I was writing this, we did not have a decision on where our US data facility was going to be. 
uh, DOE were saying they were going to do an FOA, they were deciding how they were going to do it. We now have that decision. It's going to be at Slack. However, it's still going to take time to set up. So we're still happy that in the interim, as a risk mitigation, we said we would set up this data facility interim on uh, the cloud. We did a, um, you know, a statement of work and ask for that. We put it out to bid. Uh, we got two bids of three um, cloud companies that we chased, and we selected Google in a tender offer um, for a three-year uh, contract. So again, I think having a, a multi-year contract is a good way of, uh, of controlling costs for these type of things, where you make a commit, you, you, get, a, you get some discounts. Um, so uh, enough on that. That's our Google team. Uh, again, how do you make sure you get the right prices? I've put a little cloud around the EDU region manager. You want to talk to the education people. All of these providers have an education part and a commercial part. You need to make sure you talk to the education part. Oh, and coincidentally, obviously, if you make a big commit, you certainly get a big team from someone like Google suddenly working with you. Um, I think you heard enough of this today. Obviously, Google, Amazon, all these things, they have a bunch of stuff. What you need to do is decide which parts of that thing you're going to use and how you're going to use them. And it can be a bit bewildering, all of the choices that you can make. You need to do those proofs of concept to figure out how you're going to do that stuff. Uh, like, you like Postgres? Great. There's Cloud SQL. Will it work for you? Well, it will, as long as you don't want PG Sphere, because that doesn't work on Cloud SQL. So all of these type of things you have to experiment with. We will actually use Cloud SQL. Uh, we had already a detailed model of what this was going to cost us in-house. So that gave us a good idea when we went to talk to, to, uh, to them about, you know, what do we need? So we were able to say, we need this amount of disk over the next three years. We need this amount of processing power, uh, more or less. Um, and that looks like these numbers of machines. So it's not super, super big. And, and we detail that a little bit more into fast, uh, uh, medium, and slow storage. We called them fast, normal, and latent. For the cloud providers, we turned that into fast and object store, infrequent object store, as you see on the bottom right. Um, and when you look at those things and you go, the, the service level with them is a little bit different to what you have in house. So maybe you don't need three copies of data if you're guaranteed that your data is safe in this object store. And so you may be able to, to go for less than you thought originally. So you'll notice the numbers on the bottom right are a little bit less. There's a few resources linked in here. Google Cloud Calculator gives you a ballpark. Um, at least it gives you an upper limit on what this might cost. Uh, the contact for the Google account team, if you're going to actually go further with it, you need to talk to them. And this uh, program's researchers link, uh, there's a lot of really good tutorials with spin-ups where you can jump in and just try things out um, you know, at no cost in basically something like a Jupyter Hub environment that they provide for Google. Um, again, uh, cost, I put some numbers on here. I can't tell you what I'm paying Google. Uh, they were competitive, um, and so that's all I can say about it. Uh, a competitive compared to what it was going to cost me in-house. The in-house prices are, are listed there for my 2020, 21, and 22 for what I thought I would need to buy to run what I need to run. Um, then, of course, there's staff costs on top of that. It gets very difficult to compare these things at some point. Um, but the nice thing with something like Google, when it's interim, I can shut it down and it's not costing me anything. I can stop it. It's a bit more difficult when I bought all the hardware and stuck it somewhere. And in my case, for the next few years, since I don't know where I'm going to end up, or I didn't know when we started this process, it's not good to buy hardware necessarily. Um, you get a lot of help from Google, I think, uh, when you're trying to set this up. The big team I showed you already above. Um, and they also give you, or they've given us, uh, a third party consultant to help us set up the IAMs and the structures and the projects, which is really quite nice. Um, and it's good to have somebody to help you with that because you know, we had set some of this up before, it wasn't really great. Uh, where, what, how can you get started with this kind of stuff? I put the Google Cloud credits here. I had used this before. For example, when we ran the workshop at LSST Europe for about 80 people or 100, we wanted to show them the science platform a few years ago. I applied for Google Cloud credits and they just gave me 10 or 10K worth of credits. So I was able to spin up the science platform and let everyone in the room use it, which was quite fun and nice. Um, and so for that kind of thing where you don't necessarily have um, all the resources that you want, you can get some credits if you want to do a processing run. Um, I got the impression that like getting 5K from this is reasonably easy. Uh, 10K, probably not too difficult, a bit more maybe. 
may be a bit more difficult, but if you want to run some experiment, you can easily get a little bit of uh, credits, a little bit more than your standard few hundred dollars that you get when you create a, a cloud account for free. Um, PhD candidates are always eligible for $1,000 of credits to play with stuff. So those are kind of useful, I think, um, for getting started. Uh, other things, uh, the Google program for scientific research and higher education, that's where you want to go coming from the academic side. There's lots of examples on there of, of projects. Um, it's, it's a little bit more like the success stories, but you do get some resources and there are those links back to those nice tutorials that let you um, get some exposure to how some of this stuff actually works if you really want to. I think in 10 minutes, that's about all I have time to tell you. And that was the end of what I had on my slide deck. So I don't know if I get a question or Bruce is keeping them all to the end or not. All right, thank you very much, Will. Um, I think maybe it's best to move on to give us plenty of discussion time. Um, so, you stop sharing, please. Thank you. And our next speaker is um, Eric, and he is going to talk about um, SciServer on the cloud platform. They're all yours, Eric. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen now and find this. So, I hope everybody can see the presentation now and hear me. Yeah, we, I can see and hear you. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, first I'll introduce myself. Uh, as Bruce said, my name is Eric Micheng. Um, I'm a research scientist at uh, Johns Hopkins. And among other things, I work on uh, SciServer. And uh, so I've been here about a year. And prior to that, I happen to actually have been working at Amazon, um, not in AWS, but in the, in the search engine. And we did make heavy use of uh, AWS and uh, cloud technology. So I've been thinking about this kind of stuff for a while, albeit not really uh, at Amazon, we weren't maybe as price conscious as, as uh, we could be. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about SciServer's efforts in the cloud. So uh, maybe uh, many of you already know what SciServer is, but at least I hope most of you know what Science Platform is. Uh, I think there's been a fair amount of talk about them uh, at this meeting so far. Um, so the I think for the purpose of introducing uh, science platform, I'll just say that uh, the a big theme is to bring the computation to the data. And so SciServer is one of these uh, platforms. Um, it's also a, uh, I mean, one, one thing that's built into SciServer is uh, collaborative features. So sharing of um, uh, files, sharing of your databases, your notebooks that you're working on. Um, so in this in this graphic here, I just kind of show a, a high level overview. Like you might have a research group that's that's together that has access to a set of files. Uh, individual researchers may may have different areas of expertise and use different tools to to do different parts of the analysis. But then they can they can share them at the end together and collaborate. Um, individuals can also, of course, use the system. So SciServer was. Uh, was started some time ago, uh, really to serve the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but has since grown uh, to host uh, quite a, another range of data sets like uh, oceanography data sets, genomics, uh, like um, uh, cosmological simulations and stuff. So uh, where is SciServer? So many of you who are familiar with SciServer probably know it by the, uh, by the site that we host at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, but this is actually not the only place it exists. This is this is the SciServer.org that you might go into, and and it's free for everybody to use, and and is hosting those data sets I just mentioned. Uh, but it's also a platform that we provide uh, as a service to to other sites. So I have some examples here of where we have it, uh, and some in some places, for instance, at Max Planck, it's on on a on-premise installation, not in the cloud. At the National Institutes of Standard of Technology, we have it on AWS. Actually, um, in many cases, we deploy it on top of Kubernetes. And uh, Precision Medicine, actually, at Johns Hopkins, also has a, a fork of SciServer. It's not directly what we have at our production system, uh, and that's hosted on Azure. So there, there are a number of places for it. Uh, so this, of course, motivates um, our interaction with the cloud to some degree. Uh, oh, sorry. My uh, okay, anyway, so 
yeah, site installs like like the one at uh, NIST are a big motivation for us to use the, the cloud platform. Uh, so in, in the case of NIST specifically, they're already highly invested uh, in the cloud. They've chosen to extend their internal network in there. Um, and so that's just where it, it would be hosted. Um, so supporting that is, is a thing that gives us the opportunity to, to bring uh, Sci Server to them. Uh, this is not exactly why uh, we might host it on the cloud, but I just wanted to mention that it's a side effect um, because uh, using cloud technologies, uh, we can use these uh, more kind of elastic, like more modern uh, frameworks for deployment. Um, and so this gives us the ability to just spin it up at a place like NIST or um, spin it up for say like a hackathon event or something like that. So here specifically, we use Kubernetes and, and Helm for that. And it's, I showed the command down in the bottom here. It's as simple as this to get a running uh, side server install. Uh, another thing we've been thinking about is compute overflow. So in the cloud, uh, basically compute resources are unlimited um, in effect. Uh, so, you know, lar particularly large computations that we can't uh, host on our limited site could potentially be used over there. Um, another, another side effect of this is, um, is that you potentially have a simple charge model for this instead of having to, to, to get into complicated arrangements with uh, researchers or other universities. Um, you know, going to the cloud for something like a compute overflow could, could mean that it's just a si simplified charge model. You, they, you, they use their own account, pay for it on their own, and we don't even deal, deal with billing and stuff. Um, Another thing that side server specifically we're looking at is um, we, we work with a lot of, uh, you know, human subject data uh, for a number of our, our internal data sets. So uh, the HIPAA compliance, this Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, basically protecting uh, personal information for people. It's very difficult and expensive to run these things inside your data center. Um, uh, so cloud providers, they basically invest a lot of money, um, a lot of expertise into providing services around uh, compliance like this. And uh, just like the Precision Medicine runs components of site server in Azure, uh, partly for this reason. Uh, so this is an interesting um, aspect of, of running in the cloud for site server specifically. And uh, some of these activities are actually sponsored uh, by a, a grant we have from Microsoft itself for uh, Azure, for using Azure for this. Um, so what are the challenges that we face in doing this? Um, so I think storage costs is a big one. We've seen before already in the stock that storage is one of the, the biggest costs in the cloud and of course, uh, moving data around. So in something like Site Server or, or really any science platform, it's a lot about data archives and you can't really be elastic. They don't come and go. You have to host the, the data somewhere. Uh, so how you do this, this is, a, this is an open question, I think, uh, how and where. Um, for JHU specifically, we already have DC operations, data center operations. So, uh, you know, the motivation to move into the cloud is not necessarily there. Um, I think we've seen before that some people have made calculations that, you know, it is more uh, cost friendly to go into the cloud. But, but if it's just, you know, just storage of bytes, if you already pay for the overhead of DC operations for other reasons, this, this might not work out that way. Um, and, you know, if we do something like compute overflow, uh, we probably have to uh, move data between components uh, like the DC and the cloud. And of course, the egress from the cloud uh, through the internet can be very expensive. Um, that's one of maybe the highest costs. Uh, so I just want to mention that um, there are opportunities that may be able to sidestep this, like, um, like these direct connectivity uh, between cloud providers and your data center. Uh, they provide this stuff. The charge model is different uh, than, than a storage charge model. Um, and so I just mentioned Azure Express route here just because we've been, we've been thinking about Azure. So that's, that's a potential option for those kinds of challenges. Uh, design is another challenge for SciServer specifically. Um, we're not originally designed as a cloud native um, uh, architecture. So when I say cloud native, I mean using the, the services that are are really built upon the cloud. Like they're designed to be elastic. Those are what really save you money if you can use it. 
And uh, examples here, AWS Lambda just basically just runs a function just when you need it, charges you only for the runtime of the function. Um, Eric, uh, you, yes? you have What's two that? minutes. Two okay, minutes. I should be done in two minutes. Thank you. Great, um, thank you. So another thing we run on Kubernetes, uh, being able to use Azure Kubernetes service means that uh, if we run the compute on there, uh, it can uh, it, it can expand and contract as needed. Um, but those are those are things we have to add in to the size server. Um, so if you have uh, inelastic cases, I just want to mention here that um, on demand uh, instances can be quite expensive. But if you are willing to pay up front, reserve instances are a great way to go. So in the NIST case specifically, we already have an agreement with them for building out size server. It's one year thing. So it makes a lot of sense for us to, to ask them to buy reserved instances so they can save a lot of money there. Um, yeah, so actually I had one last point here I might as well mention in the last few seconds. Um, so another thing, uh, a lot of these are built around, um, you know, analysis are built around uh, but POSIX kind of file access, but cloud really, you it's a lot cheaper to do blob storage. So these are things to consider um, in the design of these systems. Uh, and yeah, so that's what I wanted to mention about our activities. Um, and yeah, maybe if you have questions, you can pop them in that Discord. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, our next speaker is um, Eva Moncheva from Space Telescope. And she will be talking to us about managing cloud services at STSCI. So uh, it's all yours, Eva. Thank you, Bruce. Can you uh, see my presentation? I can see it and I can hear you loud and clear as well. Excellent. Uh, let me just, oops, give me a second. Let's get rid of the Zoom window. And um, there we go. Um, all right, thank you all for coming to this. I'm really excited about having this Birds of a Feather session. So my name is Eva Momcheva and I am part of the Data Science Mission Office here at Space Telescope. And I want to also extend my thanks for a lot of the information in this pre presentation to Prem Mishra, who is um, part of our um, IT department and specifically focused on, on managing our relationships with cloud providers. Um, so let me start off with, um, this uh, slide, which has already been shown earlier, but to get you in the mindset of what we're talking when we talk about uh, cloud providers, um, the um, figure here shows the, the different levels of service that, that we're, uh, we're talking about with the traditional on-premise de deployment being um, on the left here where you're providing everything that, that you need in order to um, run your, um, your analysis or, or your, your loads. Um, and as we get into the cloud providers, uh, we um, have services um, models such as infrastructure as a service, which was touched on earlier in the talks um, today, which is what people usually think about when they think about cloud. Um, so rather than having your own infrastructure, you're borrowing machines and storage somewhere else. Um, but I think a lot of the benefits of uh, cloud can um, be realized once we start moving towards uh, platform as a service and, and software as a service and specifically platform as a service has a lot of benefits for astronomical workflows. Uh, where, you know, in addition to borrowing the, the oven, gas, and kitchen, you're also borrowing, for example, managed databases or, you know, um, managed scheduling services like uh, Batch, for example, that was uh, mentioned earlier. Um, software as a service is not quite there yet for astronomers yet, so services there are, um, for example, like Lex and recognition in um, Amazon Web Services where they provide automatic um, identification of sources in, in images or uh, automatic um, speech to text um, services. Um, but I think there, there are some um, options there for astronomers to explore um, in terms of uh, running machine learning models, for example, for large missions in the future. Um, so, um, what about costs, since this is focused on costs? Um, so the general thinking that I would like to, uh, to get in people's heads is that 
yes, the cloud model cost is different. It is a very different model of paying for a compute and services, uh, but there's definitely advantages there that can be reaped for um, astronomical workflows. Um, the cloud allows you to trade capital expenses, so upfront costs for data centers, physical servers, um, and, um, and salaries for, for people managing them for variable expenses and um, only pay the, um, the, for the services that you consume. Um, also, the variable expenses can be, for certain services, much lower than uh, what you can do on your own because of the huge, absolutely tremendous economies of scale that was pointed by some of the earlier speakers as well. Um, so while some you know, privacy expenses, you have like hardware, facilities, utilities, power, network, um, ongoing refresh of your hardware, the cloud expenses are, are different. Um, so storage, compute, database services, um, you can use multiple tiers depending on what availability you need. Um, and the services, you know, availability is variable, negotiable, and the prices is decreasing. Um, so the main benefit I see for us exploring cloud computing here is that computing and storage are becoming commodities, to quote here from a, a white paper that Arvind and I and others wrote a couple of years ago, and that Arvind, uh, that astronomers can be moving towards um, cust away from these custom infrastructure deployments that we have at our departments and institutes and using these highly reli reliable data management infrastructure uh, and focus on our core competencies, which is uh, writing algorithms, writing software, uh, writing the astronomy specific pieces um, of, of this work. Um, so um, a few words about cloud computing at Space Telescope. Um, our main motivation for pursuing cloud computing services was that um, our physical, um, our needs for compute are starting to exceed our building capacity. We literally do not have enough power uh, coming to the building for some of the missions that we're looking at in the future, specifically um, Roman. Uh, and we also wanted to explore this pay-as-you-go model because a lot of our workflows are very spiky. Uh, for example, exposure time calculators get used primarily in the few weeks before proposals. Uh, reprocessing campaigns are, as uh, Brian mentioned earlier, are happen three to five times a year. And um, um, so, and a lot of the science workflows that um, the scientists in the building um, uh, need are also very spiky. So you would get your data, you do a big processing campaign, you'd sit and write papers for the next two years. Um, and there's also innovation potential as um, in using new services that, that haven't been brought to astronomy before. Um, so we um, started using AWS. So all of our work has been focused on with Amazon Web Services. We started using through a third party provider in 2018 and in 2019, we signed uh, enterprise agreement directly with AWS. Um, so we, um, I'll mention a few words a bit more about our costing though, as um, well, I'm not going to show exact numbers here. Um, so um, a lot of the, um, the work that we're doing in AWS is on a lot of different projects currently. And these projects are both for internal operations and for science projects. So this is not a single project that we have experience in on. And I'm just kind of broadly summarizing uh, lessons learned in this talk from all of the projects. Um, so for internal operations, for example, we use cloud compute for this um, Hubble reprocessing campaigns, which where we're trying to move all of the Hubble processing in the cloud. We're also launching our uh, Jupyter Hub platform for Roman um, and other missions on AWS. This is very similar to the Pangeo platform. It's literally the same thing as the Pangeo platform that was uh, presented in a talk yesterday. Um, there's there have been a couple dozen projects across the Institute that have used cloud computing um, from very small projects to uh, like large, reduce all of the GRISM data in the archive, which is I'm a copy I on this project, uh, reduce all of the um, IR images of extra galactic sources in the archive. Um, so typical cloud costs for science projects are, are quite small. Uh, even for very large projects where we reduced all of the GRISM data, this was about 10, 10K. Um, over the last couple of years, um, this project has run. So uh, when Will was talking earlier that you can easily get five to 10K for research purposes out of some of these, um, some of the cloud providers, this could actually be very compatible to a lot of what a science project, a typical science project would need. Um, in support of this work, we've also staged a lot of data in as public data sets. So this is a collaboration we have with AWS where they're hosting all of the public Kepler K2 test and Hubble data um, for, for free, for no cost, cost to us. 
um, in Amazon Web Services. So this is currently about two, 200 terabytes of data. Um, and this is, it's actually, this data is getting quite a lot of uh, traffic. So this is uh, the monthly traffic for the last uh, two years. Uh, the data sets became public. The Hubble data became, became public in April of 2018. But you can see that there's quite a few months where um, this is how much data has been accessed in these public buckets. For Hubble, we have quite a few months where access has exceeded one petabyte. Uh, this uh, in May of 2020, maybe this was Bruce, you creating the test mosaic mosaics where a test spiked uh, significantly. Um, but this, this compares, this is like two orders of magnitude higher than the data that we're serving directly from the archive, which is of the order of 10 terabytes a month. Um, so people are using data significantly, and some of this is internal operations, of course, but this is a very different model from the model that people are using data directly from the archive. So this allows people to really launch uh, very large processes that touch uh, large uh, pieces of um, large volumes of the data. That, that we're storing there. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, how much time do I have? Should I be wrapping up? Um, you can have, let's say, three minutes. Okay. Um, I've, I have a few slides and I'll make these available about thinking about how you can curb costs. Um, so think about very well about whether your project needs to be in the cloud in the first place. Projects that work well in the clouds are pleasingly parallel or require spiky compute or a degrade volume is much smaller than the data input. Um, and, and think about like, what do you really need? Um, run small, start small, run representative examples and work out the kinks of your system before you, uh, you launch like, you know, thousands of cores um, because that, that's the kind of stuff that really costs a lot if you need to make multiple large runs. Um, a lot of people I imagine are like running smaller projects. So kind of lessons learned for running small projects and keeping the costs down. Um, use the free tier, all of the cloud providers for, have free tier, use the free tier to scope your project, learn some, uh, watch some videos online, experiment, learn some more and determine if this is a cloud project at all using um, some of the criteria that I mentioned earlier. Uh, use cloud calculators to estimate resources. All of them have them apply for research credit. Check if your institution already has an agreement. If you're at a new university, it is likely that the university already has an agreement with a cloud provider. Uh, and if you go under the umbrella, you'd get some preferential pricing. Set all the billing alarms. This is something that I've learned. Uh, is that you know all of the cloud providers allow you to set some billing alarms and you can also automate shutdown of your workflows once you've reached a certain cap of spending which allows you to just really um, understand it and keep your costs down for large projects if you're an institution or a large project trying to get into the cloud um, use all of the possible discounts and negotiate 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 have someone on your team who really understands how cloud works um, and you can combine these discounts and these are some of the discounts that we're taking advantage of in our enterprise agreement. I can have like a flat, say 10% discount on all spend, upfront payments. If you know, if you have predictable workflows, you can get 50 to 60% discount. This is from the sticker price you see on the website. Uh, plan for storage upfront. You, if you know what your storage is, you can get 10 to 20% discounts. You can get credits on top of these discounts, uh, especially if you're a research institution and you're planning. And these are some of these uh, workflows that you're running there are research based. Um, and also, talking about um, egress uh, waivers, um, usually you can get 15% of your annual spend. Um, uh, waived into in egress so for example if you're spending a hundred thousand um, dollars in costs on, on amazon web services or google for that matter the first fifteen thousand dollars of egress gets waived and that's um, for google is standard to internet two members um let me i'm gonna skip through all of these and just jump to the end and just kind of like um, have a few summary slides um one of the things that concerns me is that there's a lack of direct engagement, at least in the US, of agencies and funding bodies with these cloud providers, uh, where this creates this environment where each institution needs to negotiate pricing individually, um, and you, your mileage varies on exactly where you work and who um, negotiated your agreement. I see this is like potentially dangerous um, for, for astronomy. Um, and um, if for if you're concerned about costs, costs are decreasing and will continue to decrease and the economies of scale are definitely in our favor. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Eva.
Okay, I will um, give the next presentation. And are you able to see my slides? Yes, yes. Can be. Okay. okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about creation of test uh, mosaics with Amazon Web Services. Uh, one second while I just start my own timer up. Okay, um, so why, why are we building this uh, mosaic of the test uh, images? Well, we wanted to answer two questions. One is, can tests act as a low surface brightness observatory? It turns out it can. Um, and secondly, is TESS a good case study for processing large image data sets on the cloud? And the answer is yes, very much so. I'm going to talk about the cloud computing part. If you are interested in the science at all, I've put a, a few slides in the back up, but I won't speak to them today. Right. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if you're not familiar with TESS, I think it's instructive to understand a little bit about the observing cadence and its sky coverage. Um, on the left, you see the instantaneous field of view of the test cameras. There are four of them all together, 24 by 24 degrees in each camera, arranged in a strip 24 degrees by 96 degrees. And the sky is arranged in 20, I'm sorry, 26 of these, script, of these strips, 13 in each hemisphere. So the observing cadence is to uh, stare at one uh, strip, for, one sector as it's called for I think about 30 days and it moves over to the next one and then the next one and it continues that way so it's covered the entire sky. So in this project we uh, did a mosaic of the 21 sectors that had been released in the spring of this year. All right, first thing we did, and this is something I would strongly recommend to people who are thinking of using the cloud on a fairly large scale, we did a project on premises. We set up a um, Sloan cluster at IPAC and we did a mosaic of the first five test sectors in camera four. You can see the image there. Uh, the details of this are on a research notes of the AAS, uh, which I uh, posted as a link to the bottom. Now this is really invaluable to us because none of us really understood these images very well. And it turned out there's a lot of complications to them. And we learned a lot that really helped us in moving across to the cloud. In particular, for instance, if the images in a set aren't quite co-registered. So you know, we did some effective dithering. We oversampled by a factor of three. That means you'd need a lot more temporary storage. Um, we assumed that partial reprocessing Processing was needed because some of the images look grungy. In fact, that means you have to keep all the reprojected images, intermediate ones, that's 150 terabytes altogether. Uh, we all, but we did find we can process each set of images, 1,200 of them, separately, so that it's easily parallelizable. So this, this in fact, became an exercise in parallel parallelization on the cloud. In fact, we parallelized it with 336 instances, 21 sectors by four cameras, by four CCDs, 1200 images in each. Um, one of the issues we had, and honestly, it was our own fault. We had uh, a very generous set of credits from Amazon to do this project. Uh, they were about to run out last spring. Uh, we had a very late start on this because um, all three of us were involved in various proposals and involved in other projects which had hard milestones and some we were running out of time. Uh, so to make up time, we had to use the shared file system, gave us huge flexibility and very good IO, but it was a major cost. And I'll describe that more later on. Um, actually doing the processing was straightforward. You know, we use a pre-built machine image. So we just turn machines on and off and send them jobs. And that was actually done with the Amazon uh, AWS CLI. Uh, so for the processing itself, um, uh, we used, let's see, we used a virtual CPU per test image, 21 by C 5.4 extra large EC2 instances. Uh, it's 336 altogether. 
Uh, we use the Amazon Linux 2 AMI, which we augmented with Montage and Docker, GCC, uh, and registered this as our own AMI. Um, now each EC2 instance has enough EBS storage to do the local processing, but we added elastic file storage cross-mounted to all instances for sharing the intermediate results. This is where the cost came in. Now, we actually did this through very simple shell script. We could do a Splurm setup or build a Docker container and run it that way. We, we didn't, but it's an experiment we um, think we should do. The other thing we had to make sure we did was clean up and reprocess at, or the clean up after we've done all the processing and reprocessing because the cost can really start to build up. Now, the storage solution, this is where the big costs came in. There were really three options. Um, there's the simple storage service, S3, which is cheap, but it's slowest, and you have to copy between EC2 and S3 uh, every time. There's the elastic block storage, uh, where you have disk spaces that's mounted to a single EC2 instances. We had a lot of instances, so that would be fragmented. The best solution for the time scale we needed to get things done on, which was a few weeks, was, was EMS, which is functionally very similar to uh, you know, the network file system, which most of you are familiar with on premises. But there's a price to pay, which is the price you pay. It's 30, cent, 30 uh, cents gigabyte months compared with 0 0.023 for simple storage service. All right, so um, the processing scenario uh, was actually fairly straightforward. We pre-generated a set of tangent plane projection headers for all the stacked images, constructed scripts to process the 1200 images, uh, build and run the script that uses the AWS CLI, start the 16 scripts on each of the machines, and then uh, add everything together onto a co-added plate. So we ended up with 336 stacked and co-added images, one for each camera pointing and uh, CCD. So there were some problems with this. Perhaps the biggest one is at the bottom. We did in fact find that there were bad headers in 700 images. Uh, the flux was reprojected several degrees away from the image. Uh, that's why we have to keep the reprojected images. We then have to go back and, and remove them. Now, this is what the final mosaic looks like. It looks a little bit grungy, even with the background modeling that Montage is able to do. It is, however, good enough for the science purpose. On scales of you know, four or five degrees, it's pretty smooth, and you can actually use it for low surface brightness uh, astronomy. Uh, I'll show you the nasties. The, the image at the bottom is the, what happens when you reproject the images with the bad solutions. Um, now, the real problem that's left in the final image is scattering. Uh, need to remedy that. We can choose frames where the Earth and the Moon are below the lip of the sunshade. We didn't know that when we started doing the processing. And in fact, the, the test support team are helping us uh, get rid of Add images so that we can redo it. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of credits, so we have to start again <laughs> uh, to do that processing. Now, the bottom line, um, the total was 31,000. Uh, this is at full retail cost. There was no negotiated here. Um, the vast majority of, the, of that money $28,000 worth went into the storage of the reprojected images. The actual processing itself uh, was $2,000. There was approximately $700 to do the processing and the setup. So this is a really interesting experiment and in how careful you have to be with managing your costs. We would not have been able to do this experiment on this time scale had we had to pay for it ourselves. We found ourselves very fortunate that we had credits to, uh, to do the processing. So if I might summarize everything that we've learned, and I think this does repeat some of what uh, uh, Eva was mentioning, do a pilot project on premises to really help you understand the data. It was a big help here. Use free or low cost tiers to do the setup that will save you time and money. Uh, 
John Good found that using the Amazon CLI to optimize the compute resource management was also really helpful. Um, try and use S3 whenever you can, but you, <laughs> you don't get the performance. You have to allow plenty of processing time, but you would get it back. Uh, monitor your costs daily, have the alerts turned up to the highest level. Uh, I think that's a really important thing to do, especially if you're doing something at fairly large scale. And finally, ask Amazon for support for the resources you need. In fact, they gave us special permission to use the 336 um, instances. Um, I am incredibly helpful and useful when we were doing this project. And, uh, hand, uh, tip of the hat to them. They, help, they, they really helped us get this project done on time. All right, so that is the end of that presentation. Uh, let me just stop sharing for a second. That presentation was an originally done um, at uh, a cost management workshop that we did at IPAC in the spring of this year. And I'd like to end by giving a quick summary of that, uh, that workshop. So I'm going to share my screen again. Final presentation. I hope you can see that. So this, this workshop was held in the spring of this year. We had several sessions up to 90 minutes each. There was about 30 people from IPAC at each of them. <clears throat> it, its goal was twofold. Uh, to help proposers and project leads understand how they can go about estimating and managing cloud costs and how to plan for design trades between commercial processing, co commercial computing, and on-premises computing. Uh, so while you're listening to this, uh, please note none of the studies or recommendations for a service or a provider. Uh, the performance and costs here do represent a snapshot from spring of this year. Uh, the costs do vary with time. They're continuously changing. Um, someone once described it as if you're starting to eat your dinner at a restaurant and then you find that the cost of the meal has changed while you're eating it. Uh, and finally, none of the costs here include institutional overhead. I'm not permitted to reveal that uh, information. And so these are simply the costs that come straight out of Amazon. Um, there are three types of sessions, one discussing cost trade-offs in uh, migrating compute and storage, uh, another set in case studies of costing cloud computing and science projects that have been led at IPAC. And finally, a uh, hands-on session where we used AWS cost estimation to estimate the cost of a project. What did we learn from all of this? Actually, a lot. Um, there was a huge amount of valuable information shared between projects. Uh, I've been using cloud services for a number of years now. And you now I learned a lot about what people were trying to do with the cloud locally. Um, the hands-on sessions, I think people found particularly valuable, uh, especially for those who have not used the cloud very much. And I'm wondering, this is perhaps a question to put to the audience, would it be worth having community-wide workshops on cloud costing held at national astronomy meetings where you get a, a big audience? All right, so I'm going to give some highlights. Um, a number of the presentations actually contain cost information that people wanted to use to put in a proposal, and therefore I was asked not to present these. Uh, therefore, obviously, I won't. But a number of people did give me permission to include highlights from uh, one or two of the slides. It's certainly not complete, but it's simply a sampling of the presentations that were done. Um, one is, oh, if you want to migrate a data center, you know, there's no one size fits all solution to this. And this slide, which David Imel made available to me, shows that in some cases, the cloud is the winner, if you will. And in some cases, IPAC is. But you really have to do due diligence and go through your cost estimation in detail. Uh, in fact, one of the most profound comments about the cloud that was ever said to me was Ian from my, um, Ian Foster, who's a professor of computer science at University of Chicago. 
who said, never go to the cloud with the expectation that it is going to cost you money. It will either cost you the same amount of money, it will cost you more money, or it will cost you less. You have to work out which of those is going to be true. Uh, secondly, uh, it's really important to keep on top of the providers. I mean, the, the land is enormous. Wikipedia uh, lists 143 storage providers, 285 cloud computing providers. Uh, penetrating this can be daunting and intimidating. My suspicion is that you know, only a few of those will probably be really valuable in astronomy, but it's not always completely obvious which ones they might be, apart from the big three of AWS, Google, and Azure. Uh, there's one example here from Wasabi, which is a cloud storage provider uh, and Joe Mozzarella put together this cloud comparison, cross comparison, so that if you need AWS S3 type storage, e Wasabi may be a very good choice because it has no egress or API charges at all. And so the cost, for instance, of a thousand terabytes, 289K in Amazon, 74k in wasabi but i believe they only offer cloud storage they don't offer compute service um, so for the hands-on cost estimation the is really valuable we did four of these examples one is uh, migrating static websites to a commercial cloud surge reprocessing on commercial clouds cloud-based backups and hosting a database given uh, excuse me, database driven project. So let me give just a couple of examples here. The cost comparison of doing backups on the cloud, it turned out the cost was a wash, 0 0.001 gigabytes a month on site and on the cloud. So if you move to the cloud, it would be for reasons other than pure cost. Perhaps for instance, you're running out of space and on-premises as your data sets are getting bigger and bigger. And finally, this is search processing for a ZTF-like system. If you wanted to use AWS to catch up on a full night's processing you know, by uh, running a pipeline up 10 times the original rate. So in this case, it would be 640,000 images, each one taking 377 seconds. The computing is not so bad at 1,700 a day. But the real killer, as is often the case with the cloud, is that downloading all of that 185 terabytes of processed data can run a bit shy of $10,000. And this is one of the places where the cloud can lead you into fiscal black hole because egress charges on Amazon tend to be very high. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I think it's now time to open the floor to um, a discussion. I did set up a poll and I'm going to look at the results on the web page right now. And I'd like to use this as a guide, if I may. 45% um, of respondents would wanted to discuss taking advantage of free, of re free or reduced cost services. Uh, and then the next most popular was fiscal black holes. What, what are they? That I can fall into? And finally, what are the best practices for optimizing performances and reducing my costs? So I will open the discussion to the floor. So might I suggest then that we start a discussion on taking advantage of free, on free or reduced cost services. If you have a question or a comment, I would request please you raise your hand or put a question in uh, the Q&A. Uh, okay. What? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Questions over on um, Discord. Does anyone have experience with non-Google and non-AWS storage and compute from Anastasia? Um, everything focused on the big dogs, and I think that's fair. I don't have any experience with anything else. 
how do I? <laughs> Well, I think a lot of the a lot of the other companies cater more to um, to larger companies, um, you know, rather than selling directly to consumers who may have you know small projects that you want to run. Um, a, a lot of other you know companies just target you know big banks or you know if you're a company that runs software. So um, mm -hmm. the these like you know Google, Amazon. And Azure are the ones that have the the widest range of services that are open to like you know mm -hmm. individual people wanting to run projects. Mm -hmm. well, Superstore is with the biggest discounts as well, for especially right now. I mean, they're they're very interested in academic and astronomy, and so they're willing to really give good deals just now. Who knows? There's a question for you, Eva, on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, either it's not sure if this went through already. It's from Mario Jury. Uh, fantastic summary. Thank you. The difference in access volume petabytes on cloud versus terabyte, 10 terabytes served on premises, if I understood correctly, is striking. Do you know the details of the additional accesses? What are users doing now that they couldn't do before scientifically? And are these mostly internal or external? Um, yeah, I can answer all of these. Um, so it's about an even split between internal and external. Um, so most of the users are doing things that require access to tens or hundreds of thousands of, um, of files um, in order to run um, their use cases. So some of the internal things, for example, were um, aligning images to Gaia. Um, and some of the external ones were um, reducing all of the slitless spectroscopy data. So, you know, there's probably 500,000 images of slitless spectroscopy that Hubble has taken with its two cameras and have this capability. Um, and just reducing all of them was like an example that, you know, you wanted to start with the, the, the raw images uh, that the instruments produced and, and those are stored in the public data sets. And, and that's actually a use case that I am part of that project. Um, so yeah, this is this is mostly shuffling data from S3 to some sort of compute. It's like half of it is probably Lambda, half of it is like EC2 instances. Um, okay. Thank you, Eva. Uh, there, there's a question on um, Discord from Robert Mikuta. Has anyone encountered this problem and found a solution for it in the cloud? Big N dimensional array in a single file, e.g. HD. HDF5 for the on-fly interpolation on this array I, need, array, I need to memory map it as I can't load terabytes onto RAM. Um, the S3 bucket storage doesn't work. So uh, it needs to be a native file system next to the compute. I've been looking for a long time, including Wasabi, et cetera. Uh, I'm aware of EG, this is a uh, matthewrockland.com blog HDF in the cloud, but that's not the same problem. Does anyone have experience this? Well, it sounds like data shader type thing, but it's not, it's hard to know what Robert wants to do exactly with this. Um, yeah, this is not a use case I've actually come across before. Um, if I might make a suggestion to Robert, um, ask for AWS educational credits or research credits and do an exploratory project on Amazon and see if you can make it work. And also, I'm not sure what institution you're at. If your institution has an AWS rep who's technically very savvy, um, talk to them and start asking them how you can, might, might be able to go about solving this problem. Maybe you should unmute Robert so that he can talk. Yeah, I mean, maybe while we're talking, I mean, I've also yeah. looked at this Matthew Rocklin um, article and, and the issue is that, you know, S3 is not a regular, you know, file system. Um, mm. And maybe looking into these, some of these chunking, like the czar type files, that's what you want to do. And that's where a lot of the industries that have these large files are going. And I think that's exactly what this Matthew Rocklin 
article is that it's 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 very hard to work with large files in cloud computing. You need to chunk them. And Mario said, go to Parquet, which is yeah, what, what yeah. we do. Uh, Robert, if you wanted to speak, I couldn't find you on the attendee list. If you could raise your hand, if you yeah, wish to. Speak. He says he's on YouTube. Yeah, the audio is better on YouTube, and I just it doesn't lag. Ah, okay. All right. Um, the next comment uh, was from Mario Jurek. Has anyone encountered this problem and found a solution in the cloud? Oh, I'm sorry, this is from Robert. Uh, we found the best thing to do is reformat the data to be in more cloud native formats. ZTF data was in a partition parquet. Ah, okay. And Stephen Gwynn comments more, more generally, you might want to work on the cutouts versus the whole file. Yeah, and you can you can do a range requests mm -hmm. um, against S3 buckets. Yeah. Um, here is a comment from David Shoup, as mentioned further down in Matthew Rockland's post, other formats like ZAR have been developed for this. And Seb Fabro comments, you may want to check uh, VAEX on S3. Yeah, I think, I think VAX is a bit like the data shader with, with Parquet files. That they, they all function in similar manners. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is you have to get to a cloud native format like Parquet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew McNichols is typing a question. Okay, there's a comment uh, from. Anastasia, Alexov, to me, you mentioned that backup was a tie between self-hosted versus cloud. Does the scale uh, to a variety of data, what's the range that this is a tie? Uh, the range is about a petabyte. Um, my suspicion is, and I do not know if this is true, that as you go above a petabyte, the cloud may get proportionately cheaper their rates are reduced as you go to higher volumes, but you'd have to do the numbers, I think. And Bruce, you, uh, I put explicitly on my slide, when you do that calculation, are you including the storage engineer who looks after your petabyte every year? Your storage engineer? No. Hmm. You have no people looking after your hardware? No people, but that, that's not included in the cost I mentioned. That's what, so, so your break-even cost for cloud versus in-house doesn't include people in-house who look after your hardware. No, no right. it's really a break-even storage cost. Yeah, so the cloud's a lot cheaper, right? Uh, it could well be. It depends what our engineer needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Does it, does it include your engineer swapping disks every few months? Um, they fail. Yeah, I don't know how much of that he actually does. Um, so yes, that labor cost would go away. Mm. Well, I mean, also, I think we, we just routinely update storage every five years rather than mm -hmm. waiting for it to fail. So I think that, that mm -hmm. cost also needs to be included. Mm -hmm. I just spinning disks to be swapped. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, a comment from Andrew McNichols. To paraphrase public comments from the Pangeo folks, folks, there is no widely accepted standard for cloud optimized n dimensional arrays of science data. Resolving this issue should be a point of emphasis for our community. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. That, based on what was said, I think <laughs> that is a very good, uh, very good comment. Yeah, and I think I think this is um, this is a very good comment, and I agree. But I'm not sure that there is a unique file for every scientific that that is that serves all scientific communities. I think maybe yeah. for astronomy, um, something that we've been talking about, and we've done a little bit of work is cloud cloud compatible FITS files, um, mm -hmm. and we're doing specifically work on this um, around tests because one of the biggest workflows for tests is getting cutouts like straws through the cubes. Um, as you may be aware, um, this is not necessarily the same thing that would work for, you know, Ruben, um, uh, uh, yeah, um, Roman images, um, but 
you know, we're, we're looking on how to make FITS files cloud compatible. Mm -hmm. um, we've also, yeah, considering the czar arrays as well, that, that may be something that we want to do with FITS files, just cast in a czar arrays with a header. Okay, uh, Megan Sosi is typing a comment right now. While they're typing, might I put it to people? I mean, do you think it's worthwhile to have um, a workshop on cost management at a national, a national astronomy meeting? Um, or is this more of a, if you will, um, a niche topic that is much more suited to ADAS? Or technology meeting. I don't know the answer. <laughs> My suspicion is the latter, but I, I really don't know what other people think on that. Okay. Oh, Robert. Uh, Kathleen says Robert is on Zoom now and ready to speak. Uh, if I, if I may. Yes, please. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, first, everybody, for you know the comments you provided on Discord, I appreciate them. Uh, the problem, as we've seen, is um, um, to to be able to run some memory map a large data file or a large array uh, in the cloud, um, you have to jump through hoops apparently, and and uh, maybe adopt even quite exotic data formats. And that's not what we want to do. That's not what I want to do, right? I want something that is um, that can be um, moved, migrated from any kind of platform or computing uh, uh, instance to another, uh, local or, or in the cloud. So um, what's a good data format, right? HDF5 is mature uh, and also um, quite powerful in the sense that you can define your own schema and, and um, the data can be of any kind of format or any kind of uh, structure that you want. So in my case, you know, I developed a, a, an application uh, locally uh, using HDF5, it worked beautifully. Uh, and now I'm gonna move to the cloud, right? Because I wanna scale and that doesn't work. Suddenly I was surprised to see that there's apparently no uh, easy solution to, um, to, to have what I, what I wanted, namely memory mapping of HDF5 files. And um, it, it was a big surprise to me that there was nothing like that. I thought it would be you know, a common need, but uh, I'm not sure um, what the experiences that others have. Uh, do you Hi, just Robert, immediately, um, go ahead, please. Sorry, I'm just curious what, uh, while you're talking about, what's the um, what's the specific issue with the memory mapping on the cloud? Because I mean, I think the instances don't have any particular restriction against that, right? In the end, they're, they're, you get a Linux instance and if you have the storage and the space and then, and the stuff like, uh, it should generally, work the same so what is what kind of exact problem are you okay. so my issue is that you know that s3 bucket storage is is is, is file based right um you cannot memory a memory map uh, an hdf file or any other file there uh through s3 you would have to have that locally uh on the instance um oh, right but if you brought it to the instance then you have no particular problem right, so but it's really that, bringing it to the instance storage like an ebs volume or something yeah and i think maybe the, the cost is ultimately the prohibitive factor right if it's terabytes well, the, of data the cost on EBS, like I mean, I think um, uh, Bruce showed that in a slide. It's a bit more expensive, maybe double the cost or so. Uh, but you can you can actually store your data on there. So um, it, yeah. who knows if it's worth the extra cost? But it, mm -hmm. it's a factor there. Yeah, mounting an S3 bucket as elastic block storage might be your solution. Mounting an S3 bucket as uh, block storage. Yeah, EBS. Well, or keeping or... keeping the the file in EBS, or alternatively. If you if the bandwidth is good enough, you can you can keep your file on on uh, S3 and then bring it to the instance each time. But if you're talking about many terabytes, that might not be fast enough for you. But that's yeah, certainly that's a model that's used on yeah. the cloud uh, fairly often. Is is mm -hmm. pulling from S3, doing some local processing, and then yeah. pushing back somewhere. Right? Yeah, I agree. If, if the files were smaller, that, that would be a viable solution. But if it's one junk, gigantic chunk, right, then uh, maybe it's better to mount it. I look into this. Thanks. I, I was not aware of it. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Thank you for the contribution, Robert. Um, there's a couple more comments on uh, holding a workshop at a national meeting. Anastasia Alexov points out that NAS may be a good place since government staff are there and they should be aware of all the problems. Um, that is a good point. Although I do think that and certainly NASA, well, NASA and NSF in the US are well aware of all the problems because the various NASA uh, archives and data centers have been discussing this with NASA already. And in fact, they're uh, setting up a pilot plan to try and move over 
least some data sets to the cloud. Um, certainly the NSF is very well aware of this too. So uh, if they weren't aware, yes, I, I would agree that would be a very good thing to do. Uh, Mark Pound in the Q&A says, I don't think it is a niche topic. It could be good for an AAS meeting. There may be individual investigators who are interesting in cloud, compu cloud computing, excuse me, as opposed to the kinds of heavy hitter teams that are represented at ADAS. Um, yeah, I think Mark has a good point there. I, I think there is certainly confusion among a number of astronomies, astronomers I've spoken to about how they can use the cloud for doing an individual research project, you know, whether they need, need compute and storage sources for you know three months to do their project. I know a number of people who expressed reluctance to get involved because they've heard horror stories about the costs uh, and want to know, now, how do I go about doing using it? And I also know people who've been intimidated by going to the front pages of the providers and seeing this extraordinary number of services that are available. Um, so I know, how do I pick the right one for me? And I, I think the concerns are legitimate and you know, perhaps as a community, we should be addressing that. I think there's a lot that an individual scientist can do, you know, small scale project rather than a, a big consortium. I think there's a lot that can be done. So maybe, you know, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Um, all right. So there's a question further up from Thomas about, uh, I mean, basically the question is locking and, and is anyone planning to move off? And there was some answer also from oh, somebody that's gone off my screen. Um, but I think that that's, uh, I know what the others think, but uh, we did proof of concept both with Amazon and with Google to prove we could do both things, do the same thing in both places. Even if it's slightly different, it's more or less the same as long as you stick with the kind of orchestration tools like uh, Kubernetes or whatever. As soon as, of course, you start to use um, one of the scheduling tools of Google or Amazon, then you're kind of getting, you're starting to get the lock-in. Um, so yeah, at least we're conscious of that on the Ruben side. We try to be, um, you know, as, as I said, we have to move from wherever we are now to some USDF in a couple of years. So I need to make sure everything ports um, and so we're, we've been trying to, you know, do as much as possible with that kind of orchestration technology, ergo CD and Kubernetes. Um, also, um, Thomas, we have funding from NSF to uh, address that very topic to see how well we can migrate image processing from Amazon over to Google and Azure. Uh, we'll be addressing that next year. So maybe next ADAS will have some answers on that one. We're not expecting there to be vast differences and we're not expecting it to be difficult. All right. I guess in addition to being able to spin up the resources and actually put your infrastructure there, there's also the, the potential moving of data. I don't mm -hmm. know if people thought about that. Yeah, I, I, I have a suspicion that it's the setup that's the issue and not actually running the processing. Um, it'd be sort of different enough that you have to do more. question from, from Andrew McNichols to maybe Sean Yu, because he seems to have a few, few thoughts on the topic. Uh, it, he says moving large scale data transfer, which is true, if we end up with petabytes on one provider, we need to move to the other. Of course, mostly they're happy for your ingress, so they're not going to care if you move it from one to the other, but the previous one's going to charge you a fortune to take the data out, of course. Um, and it is a problem. <laughs> Oh yeah, yes. so Andrew, I think uh, at least my intention for Ruben is to at least keep one copy out of the cloud somewhere, even if I end up working in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, and right. I mean, with, with at Space Telescope, we're actually contractually obligated to serve a free copy. Um, so we have a copy on premises. Yeah, I should perhaps clarify the experiment we want to do is not at that scale. It's migrating over processing of say 50 to 100 terabytes of images which is much more manageable, of course. Um, I, let me see, more questions. Dimitri Luna, um, how broadly should cloud costs be taught to astronomers? We should focus on computation interfaces for astronomers 
such that they aren't aware of the cloud at all. Um, I, I think that's a great goal. Um, I think one of the difficulties with the cloud is that the um, costing is very fine grained. Everything is charged at a different rate. And so, and it can change uh, under you. And so I, I think just being unaware of the cloud at the moment isn't feasible. Uh, although it would be a lofty aim. I, I think you know, if funding agencies negotiate deals with the Amazon well, the big providers, and you can just go ahead and use it as if you were running uh, jobs on your local cluster, I think that's when it would become feasible. So I, I, I think costs do need to be taught. These issues do need to be taught to astronomers at the moment. In fact, that was the motivation for the cloud cost workshop that we had at um, IPAC, that anyone now who wants to use the cloud and has to pay for it, I think has to be very careful. I mean, Eva gave a very nice list of uh, issues that you have to address and that you have to be mindful of. That said, I do agree with Dimitri that there are cases where, you know, the user can be completely unaware of where the data sits or where the services run. And this is where what we talk about in a lot of the cases of the science platforms and a lot of the science platforms that we're building, they do live in Amazon Web Services, but you know, we're picking up the tab for anything that the user does. And we're to a certain extent limiting what the user can do so that that tab stays reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if Will can speak whether they're planning to run their science platform um, in Google or, um, or not, but somebody mm -hmm. needs to pay ultimately. Um, yes. And there's a, there's a cost model for <laughs> running something in-house. And of course, if we move to Google, so the advantage for me, if, if I put the science platform on Google, I can have my cost model to provide a certain amount of compute to the community that I was going to provide. I think the advantage, and Mario's just asking a similar question, is that if you then get a grant and you have your 10K, which is not that much, the data is there and you can bring a whole bunch of compute resources. Maybe I can't give it to you. As soon as I host this in one place, I'm limited in the compute that I can provide to any one user. And even if they have money, it's difficult for me to provide them more compute. Um, and so for me, that's a big advantage. And one of the things I'm considering is how would like an object store in in-house object store with temporary caching on cloud work if I had a good enough internet connection, considering most of it's in and little's out, most people process lots and get a little bit back. So if I, if I hosted, because hosting the data is the big cost, if I did that somewhere else, would that make this much more cost effective? Because compute with scavenged resources is much cheaper if I can use those uh, you know, instantaneous resource, uh, resources, which we can do with things like Condor Annex, et cetera. So I, I, it's complicated. And so, so Mario was asking, how do we split between user cost versus um, you know, our, our in-house cost data bandwidth storage? So as I say, the, I think every project will have some sort of budget and that will get you a certain amount of resources. It would be so nice if users could bring their own and all of the commercial cloud providers allowed you to basically um, bring in your credits alongside someone else's credits and give them, you know, I could, I could grant a certain amount of resources to someone and they could use their credits to get more. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a good model. Um, yeah, one topic that just came to mind, which I'd like to bring up, um, in the US, cloud computing is a service and most institutions, certainly mine does, charges overhead on this, which really increases the cost. Um, is this circumstance unique to the, to the US? Does that also happen in other countries? I, I really don't know the answer to that. Is there such thing as overhead in other countries? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are less in Europe. Um, yes. I haven't worked at a university in Europe, but I mean, I've, I've worked with them. Um, it'd be good if one, one of the uh, local academics piped up on overheads, but they're not, I mean, they're not like the 50% that happens in the States, which makes me go crazy. Oh God, it's more than 50. <laughs> yeah, so you're at IPAC, 100% at IPAC. 
No, it's not like that. I, I can't tell you what it is, but it's it's not a hundred. Um, it's still high though. Uh, okay, I, I was just wondering, um, I, I think the NSF is looking into ways to avoid people having to pay this overhead. It's setting up a program based at I think San Diego Supercomputer Center and PI by Mike Norman, it's called Cloud Bank. Uh, and if you get cloud credits from an NSF program that uh, you, you've requested and have been awarded cloud credits, they, Cloud Bank will manage them for you so you don't have to pay any overhead. I think that's a project that's been, I think it's been running for maybe a year now. Um, but it's one way in which you can avoid the overhead in the US. Um, I read, let's see, I also read somewhere that the NIH has been doing this for two or three years with their researchers to avoid overheads, but I don't have any technical details on that. Um, all right, so there's a few more comments on Discord, Nuria Lorente says, agreed, giving the individual researcher the benefit of the heavy hitters experience is important. I've heard of much dollars being spent by individuals and small groups because they're not aware of what can be done with credits, um, etc. cetera. Um, yes, I, I think education on that would be very good. Um, Anastasia Alexov makes a very interesting suggestion. I would love a lesson crib sheet on cost negotiations. Um, sounds like William had some slide hints from his slides. A central astronomy entity to do this would be fabulous. Um, I think Mario's posted Cloud Bank a bit further down as the NSF's potential answer to some of these questions. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, it is an issue that various people are working on, but not there yet. Um, yeah, and that's why I think I've been making the case for you know, negotiating as a, as a field rather than individual institutions, because also it, it's not just depends on, it doesn't just depend on negotiation, it depends also on how much are you willing to spend. So an institute like, you know, Space Telescope is probably putting I don't know, maybe several million over a few years. And that's a big enough contract for AWS to give us a lot more incentives um, for that contract, whereas a smaller institution or an individual researcher cannot yield that power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a big advantage of being at a major institution. Uh, I'm inclined to think though, in the US, it would be it would be better if the funding agencies, NASA and NSF, negotiated directly with the providers so that anyone who uh, gets an award from NSF or NASA is able to take advantage of them, whether you're at ST or Caltech or at a you know, small college in Idaho, it shouldn't really make any difference. Uh, I, I, I think it would be wonderful if someone solved the problem of all of the ground-based data astronomy sites which have no home, including yeah. LSST when it finishes. There's no plan from NSF to host LSST data at the end of the survey. Mm -hmm. and all of that somewhere on a cloud resource that would break a lot of, you know, it would certainly make it an interesting topic for NSF to look at um, and make it interesting for a cloud provider to host it. Um, and then the rest is, uh, the biggest part, as I always say, it seems to be hosting the data. The compute becomes trivial after that. And it's and the compute is nearly always cheaper than in-house for running servers and connectivity and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, there is a project, I think it's based in Arizona, uh, that is attempting to uh, the prototype archive as much of the dark data, ground-based data as they can. I, I've just forgotten the name of the project now. Um, but that is part of the goal, and it, they're using cloud services. Um, okay, where are we? Further comments? Um, uh, Nuria commented uh, on costing, quite frustrating. So much time spent on trying to optimize a few hundred bucks here and there, watching credit run out per month, monitoring, etc. It's 
can be too daunting for individual researchers and small groups. Um, yeah, Nuria, I, I do agree with you. Um, I, I don't have a hard answer except uh, well, education, uh, and we need to train each other. I think there's a lot that can be done on the cloud for uh, one-time projects that need several months of processing and you don't want to buy an in-house machine. Um, but I don't quite know the best way of providing the right training and education and documentation. I know Cloud Bank aims to do this. I looked at their webpage about a week ago. Um, they're planning to try and do that, but most of their links are to the documentation provided by the providers. And I don't necessarily the best documents that a scientist would need to get going. Um, maybe I can get in touch with Mike Norman and ask him about this. I mean, they seem to be the central crown place for NSF. Um, I've made it to go. Thank you. Um, Hi, Mario points out, for the data sets you have in the cloud, how are the costs split between the providers and the users? What are your thoughts on models for who and how pays for data storage, data access, bandwidth, charges, CPUs? Um, uh, Eva, would, maybe is a good question for you. Um, I don't see a question, but I think I heard it. Um, so the, the data sets that we're currently storing are stored as public data sets. So um, Amazon Web Services picks up the tab. We are not paying directly for storage for the, the raw data sets themselves. Um, so anything that, that we do to them and any ephemeral storage that we need, uh, we are pairing for this. Um, yeah, so, and I think a lot of the cloud providers do have public data set offices. I definitely, yeah, I'm absolutely sure that both Amazon, Google and Azure have public data sets programs where they are interested in bringing such data sets and storing them on the cloud. It's the contract that we have with them is a three-year contract um, and they don't really have, at least Amazon doesn't have specific benchmarks of you know how much compute they expect to see against a certain data set as long as there's activity and there's community of like people being interested in developing services around that data set um, and, and some, some activity around accessing it. Um, they've been really happy with the work that's been happening against the, the Hubble Kepler and test data. So I think I'm quite for the... happy that I didn't convince NSF to just make Rubin data public because of that. Um, so we have, you know, for at least the two years while it's proprietary, it's going to have to be paid for. They won't accept it as a public data set. Um, yeah, there's a couple more comments from Peter Williams on Cloud Bank. Uh, he points out the applicability is currently quite limited for astronomers. He provides a link to the el eligible NSF solicitations. And yes, it's only some of them, I think, where you can take advantage of this. Uh, he points out later on, um, Cloud Bank has an enterprise mode, um, for lack of a better word, that can be used outside of NSF grants. Um, that's actually very interesting because when I went to their webinar a few weeks ago, that wasn't the case. Um, so I asked if I could have my uh, AWS money from a previous solicitation included in the cloud bank, and they said, no, it has to be from new, newly uh, funded grants. Oh, sorry, that's Dimitri. I'm sorry. I apologize, Dimitri. Um, so if it does have this note, that's great. I should go back and look at it. <laughs> Um, okay, there is a comment from all right, cost from S3 to EC2 in the same uh, region is free for in the same organization, but not otherwise. Um, yes, I've been caught on that one. If they're in different organizations, the request to pay is these charges could become significant at petabyte scales and you'd want to avoid them. Hmm. Okay, Brian McLean is typing. Uh, I think since it's 12.29, uh, we only have a minute left. Uh, 
this would have to be the last question, I think. I think we all want to go to virtual beer. Unmute and he might speak faster than he types. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he won't type in a Scottish accent so we can all understand him. All right, well, while he's typing, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone, um, Will, Eva, and Eric for giving the presentations. Uh, thanks to Kathleen and Francesco for helping get the BOF organized. And thank you to everyone for joining in and for contributing to this very useful discussion. And Brian is still typing. Thank you. Thank you for organizing, Bruce, and thank you all for the participation. All right. Uh, the question Brian, Should our community consider providing tools and scripts to let users set up cloud environments with best practices turn on? Um, yes. But I don't know who'd do it and when. Um, the other thing is uh, clouds, cloud services are changing rapidly. Um, you know, there are new services being provided. It's possible that such tools and scripts could become outdated very quickly. Well, I mean, I will say that uh, like I think most of us who are doing science platform, all of our Kubernetes deployment scripts, Terraforms, all of them are on GitHub, they're all public. Uh, mm -hmm. What best practices are, of course, is, a, is, is something debatable. Um, I, I will do it differently, probably to Ava, but we, we have the same goal in mind. And we do talk sometimes about how to do these type of things, but um, mm -hmm. I, I still think this is a, I, I mean, I, I remember giving a, and being invited to IVOA in Sexton four years ago or three years ago and saying this was a topic that IVOA should get involved in but they didn't know what I was talking about back then. Um, but now I think everybody's beginning to understand this deployability of notebooks or being able to execute the same thing in multiple different locations with different data sets. Um, there's a whole range of topics that we haven't managed to even consider yet. We just now have a bunch of almost the same science platforms which aren't exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, and I think... <laughs> That's very true. And I would argue we should start publishing stuff like that um, so that, you know, not just on GitHub, but also in literature that's accessible to, to most um, practitioners in the field, you know, WS journals accept software papers now. Um, so we should start writing papers where we describe what we do and give visibility, not just to each other, but to everybody else in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think we've run a couple of minutes over time, and I believe the social session is about to start. So, um, how's that working? Hmm? How's the social thing working? I have no idea. I think it's bring your own beer. Uh, Do we get the beer delivered? <laughs> <laughs> you will discover soon. <laughs> so, um, thank you, folks. It was an amazing discussion.